Welcome back to the analysis seminar. Our speaker today is Ignacio Uriarte Tuero from the University of Toronto, and his title today is Two Eight Norm Inequalities for Singular Integrals in RN. Ignacio. Thank you very much, Jose, for the invitation and everybody in the audience for hosting me in, well, almost, almost my second home, given how much time I've spent <laughs> at the at Autonoma University. So, uh, as I was telling Jose, if anybody has a question, please either interrupt or if you write it in the chat, Jose will see it. I cannot see the chat and then he will tell me or whatever because the way the screen is organized or the way I am, the, the only way I'm able to, to seem to be able to organize it, uh, I cannot see uh, well, people who are asking questions or whatever. So the topic today is, I mean, as Jose said, two weight norm inequalities for single integral in RN. Oops, no, what's going on? And it's joint work with the people here, Eric Sawyer, Chan Jensen, and in some cases also Christos Gregoriadis, Michael Lisi, and Michael Michalis Paparichos. I will explain with whom in, with, in each case. And uh, so let's see, I will focus some parts mostly on an introductory. Here's the, actually the, the topics I will cover. It's related to the Nazarov trail Volberg's conjecture. I will explain a bunch of introductory material, which many of you know, and a bunch of you may have seen also in previous topics of my in previous uh, talks that I've given. But then I will explain the local T, I mean, look, the new results which are here in the local TV theorems, no? the newest results. I will focus on that. And then, well, of course, where questions are welcome throughout the talk. So <clears throat> the, the, the goal, the two, the two weight problem is to characterize pairs of weights uh, for which this inequality holds. Now, a weight for us means a locally finite Borel measure in Rn. We work on P equals two for simplicity. And uh, T is, is going to be some operator, which I will explain in a moment what kind of operators we want. No? So let's, uh, this problem is useful or important for, well, in various instances. So one of them is a bunch of reasons are related to operator theory in which I'm not an expert. For example, the Sarason conjecture on, of, on composition boundedness of a product of two densely defined Teplitz operators, the existence of something called birkhoff Wienerhoff factorization for a given function and perturbation theory for some classes of operators. For example, the if you do a rank one perturbation of a unitary operator and ask whether you are equivalent or similar to, a, to another unitary operator, this problem is equivalent to the two-weight norm inequality. So this one here for the Hilbert transform, which I will explain in a moment what it is. And then uh, there is some relation to, uh, I mean, these two-weight norm inequalities, there's some relation in, and appears, for example, in a reasonably recent paper of Maria Jose Gonzalez and Cari Astala on the, I mean, related to the problem on connectivity of manifold of corridor curves. But of course, I mean, they do. I, I think actually Maria Jose is, uh, is also here. Uh, what I mean is they have a T of one type theorem and a two weight norm inequality theorem, but not in the case that we are dealing with here because their weights were not, ah, sorry, their weights are not locally finite for measures, but it's the same framework. It's one of the tools that they use. And it also appears in Astala's conjecture. I'll explain what that is later. So what are the model operators? So the model T's. Ignacio, we, am yeah. I the only one seeing still your first slide? Uh, uh, I'm definitely, I mean, I'm definitely not in the first slide. So OK, then, okay, then something is wrong. Maybe someone else can tell me if that's what Let everybody is saying. Is it fine now? OK, now I'm seeing a different one. OK. A different one. OK, so then I... I'm seeing the hard little with maximal operator. And yes, OK. Right. So, so then yeah, I, I, I went out of the full screen mode. Maybe that was, anyway, whatever. Now it works. Right. <laughs> Good. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. So OK, OK. So as I was saying, now I'm going to explain which type of operators, model operators, we deal with here for this T. So. A classical one, the sim these are the two simplest examples for what I want to, to say. No? So uh, for positive operators, the classical one is the hard little maximal operator, which is defined as usual, as explained here, the supremum of averages over all scales. 
with cubes with sides parallel to the axis. And the Hilbert transform, which is the model Calderon Sigmund operator. I will not define what a Calderon Sigmund operator is, but uh, I mean, 99.9% .9 of the audience knows what they are better than I do. No? <laughs> so, so anyway. And, um, but it's basically you can think of integrating against one over x in a convolution type, but because that is not absolutely integrable, you have to take the principal value of sense. And this is prototypical of the singular integrals that they converge because of a certain cancellation. And well, the case of this uh, of the Hilbert transform is has certain connections to boundary values of the conjugate analytic, the conjugate harmonic function. In the case of the upper half plane, I mean, it's a classical result in, in complex analysis. No? So let, we'll focus basically on these two. This is basically the simplest positive one operator, and this is the simplest non trivial cancellative, cancellative operator. That, so I will focus mostly on these two at the beginning, and then I will, I will go into further operators later. So let's see if I click here. Okay. So what is an A2 weight? Uh, classically, a weight. For, for this slide, then I will go back to the other context in a moment. But for this slide, a weight is a non-negative um, locally integrable function. The notation of the measure of a, of a set is any of these three. And that the weight is in A2 means that uh, you have this, the supremum over all cubes of this product of averages is bounded uniformly. What is the supreme? So there's a classical theorem of Koichmann. If you well, a bunch of theorems if you're combining those theorems of Koichmann, Pfefferman, Hunt, Mackenhaupt, and Whedon, which is that if you have the hardy little maximal operator, then you're bounded from L to of omega to L to of omega, if and only if omega is absolutely continuous and it's in A2. Uh, from right to left, it's true also for an Calderon Sigmund operator. Right, left to right, it's true for non degenerate ones. Whatever that means, but Hilbert transform is non-degenerate. It basically means that you also have a lower bound, at least along one direction, of the form one over x or one over x to the n in R. Right? But uh, this implication assumes that the mass of any ball is positive, strictly positive, to to be able to prove this implication. Right? So uh, where where do these weights appear? Well, uh, they appear, for example, as Jacobians of quasi conformal maps. They also appear as, uh, I mean, as the harmonic measure, or the, oh, sorry. The harmonic measure of, with, uh, is an AP weight with respect to surface measure, if you're for the, for the, I mean, for the Dirichlet really problem, if your domain is, for example, has a boundary which is locally ellipsoid graph. No? That's a classical theorem. And then uh, there is similar conditions for the p not equal to two, which we will, will not focus on, which are the AP weights. So this is basically, I mean, in a nutshell, the one weight of what I wanted to highlight about the one weight theory. After you do one weight, you want to understand two weights. So the naive or the first thought of two weights would be to write them like this. I mean, with one weight, you had here V plus W. If you there is a standard trick, which is to make this change of variables so that this inequality becomes the one in the bottom. And there are several reasons, and this is the preferred formulation. There are several reasons to prefer this formulation. So the first one is if you're really in the case of classical weights, which are finite and strictly positive almost everywhere, these two are equivalent. It's just a change of variables. So you lose nothing. However, if you think, for example, here in this formulation, let's say V is a singular measure. Then if T is defined with respect to Lebesgue, it's not clear what TH means. Whereas here it's very clear or clearer, let's say. Okay. Uh, or for example, let's say um, V is a measure which is zero or a weight which is zero on a set of positive Lebesgue measure. Then you could take, call it E. You could take h to be the characteristic function of e. This side is zero. So whereas t of h, usually the Calderon Sigmund operators are global operators. So then uh, would be basically non-zero essentially everywhere or mostly in most places. So this forces this weight omega to be zero basically, I mean, everywhere. No? So it's 
I mean, there are problems in those situations. And there is a general philosophy that if this is true for weights, it should be true for measures. So these problems that I just highlighted, for example, do not happen here. Because for example, if, as I said, if V is zero on a set of positive Lebesgue measure, and you put H to be the characteristic function of that set, here you get zero. Here you have problems, but here you get zero on both sides. So it's not a, so, so you eliminate those difficulties. Another reason is that here, this formulation is very easy to dualize. You just interchange the two weights, sigma and omega. And the further reason is the following. You want to characterize this type of weights, I mean, this type of inequalities. So uh, the characterization we are going to look for is a T of one type characterization, which I will explain in a moment what it means. And um, you want, but it basically means that you say that the inequality is true if and only if it's true for a certain class of functions. And in order for those, uh, for that if and only if condition to be true, the, uh, you need this formulation. These are the so-called testing conditions. I'll explain in a moment. Okay. So, so, okay, so let's look at what has been, I mean, classically done in the two weight theory for the maximal operator, which is a good example for this. So the two weight A2 condition is the same as before, but the same as the one weight, except that instead of omega and one over omega, you put omega and sigma, fine. So an old theorem of Mackenhout in Sawyer's reformulation of the theorem is that you have the weak type inequality, so from L2 sigma to L2 weak of omega, if and only if your weight is in A2. I mean, your, sorry, your weight pair is in A2. In the one weight theory, this is also true, of course, and then one weight AP weights have a self-improving property which allow you to conclude also from here the strong inequality. This is completely false in two weights. And actually, uh, well, then you basically have two routes that have been done in the literature. No? One of them is to say, well, A2 is a wonderful condition because in one weight, it's necessary and sufficient. And on top of that, it's also simple to check. So there's been a lot of literature, very good work done on trying to get a two weight characterization of the, I mean, sorry, a characterization of the two weight norm inequality with two weights in the form of an A2 type condition. You have to strengthen the A2 condition. There's something called bump conditions, etc. cetera. Uh, and as I said, I mean, there's a lot of good work done there, but this, has, this work has the advantage of being easy to check. It has the disadvantage that so far has not produced necessary and sufficient conditions. And it looks like it doesn't uh, yield those kind of conditions, no? But it gives sharp conditions, meaning sharp in the whole class of operators, of tolerance in multiple operators or things like that. No? So a, a completely different route, which is the route uh, I will be taking in this talk, is to look for a different condition, which is going to be, the good thing is it's going to be necessary and sufficient. The bad thing is that it's gonna be much harder to check and it's gonna depend on the operator. And the, the model theorem in this respect is the first, the first, one of the first theorems in this respect was proved by Eric Sawyer for the maximal operator, which says that you have the two weight norm inequality, if and only if you have it, I mean, you have it for all functions, if and only if you have it for characteristic functions of cubes. You just have to test over characteristic functions of cubes. Moreover, you don't even have to integrate over all of Rn, just over the cube cube. And this is the T of one con type condition, no? because you can think of this as the function one. So you test the operator T on the function one. One meaning all cubes. So we are looking for this kind of characterizations. And as I said, when they work, they are necessary and sufficient, but uh, well, then they are harder to check. So, okay, so let's focus now on the Hilbert transform for a good chunk of the talk from now on. Um, as I said, in order to get the two weight norm inequality, so basically this one, but with the operator Hilbert transform here, there are two obvious necessary conditions, which are the two testing conditions. So you test over characteristic functions of cubes, intervals, because we're in one, in one dimension. And this is the, the so-called forward or direct testing condition. And then you dualize the weights. As I said, you just interchange sigma and omega, and you also test over 
over characteristic functions of intervals. So this is the backward or dual testing condition. So these two are obviously necessary. Uh, there's another necessary condition that if you test, you take this function and you test over this function, because of some technicalities, you have to cut off and then eventually take limits, blah, 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 but it works. Uh, then you get that you should satisfy the so-called patent A2 condition, which is this one. So the Poisson extension of a measure at the height of a given interval is given by this formula in one dimension. And if you just evaluate this integral for x on, on the interval i, this term is zero. So you realize it's immediately bigger than the average, the Lebesgue average of omega over i. So as a this supremum being bounded means that it's bigger than the corresponding average for omega and for sigma with respect to Lebesgue, which is the usual A2 condition, which is the one that is here. Okay. So this patent A2 condition is stronger. Okay, so these three conditions are necessary for the two weight norm inequality to hold. The dream is that they would be sufficient. And the dream is only partially true as far as we know so far. So there's another condition that Nazarov, Trail, and Borberg introduced in a very important paper in the area, a seminal paper that they'll mention later, which is the so called pivotal condition. So this condition basically says that you take your favorite interval I0, you decompose into this disjoint intervals. And then you have this horrible sum, which I'll explain in a moment. And uh, you should have that this horrible sum is controlled by the measure of I0, sigma measure, times a constant. The best constant, we call it P. And the dual is the same thing with a constant P star interchanging the two measures. This, uh, this term can be understood as some kind of control or average control of oscillation. I'll explain more of it later. Okay. So then Nazarov, Trail, and Bolberg uh, proved in a theorem. I'll explain in a moment why I wrote two dates, uh, which is the following. Assume you have no common point masses in the, for the weights. Again, it's where I mean it's locally finite Borel measures. And assume they satisfy this pivotal and dual pivotal condition, the one that I just explained, this one here. Okay. So then if you assume that aside conditions, the dream is true. Namely, the two weight norm inequality for the Hilbert transform holds if and only if you have the two testing conditions and A2. Ideally, you shouldn't have to assume these two conditions, pivotal conditions, but at the time they didn't know. So they stated that maybe the pivotal conditions could be necessary for the Hilbert transform. Uh, we disproved that conjecture later by, with, I mean, Michael Lacey and Eric Sawyer. I'll explain, I'll, I'll give a picture of the example. And then if the measures are doubling and the Hilbert, and, well, if the measures are doubling and the Hilbert transform is bounded, then the pivotal condition is true. So the enemy is what's called non-doubling measures because when you run stopping Calderon Sigmund stopping times in cubes, uh, you usually stop the first time, for example, your average of the absolute value of your function is bigger than four times the previous average. So because you stopped now, but you didn't stop at the parent cube, you have control if you are doing Lebesgue measure, you have control of how large you are. No? But if your measure is non doubling, you lose that control completely. And that's the, that's the enemy of this in this thing. Okay. So let me give you an, a couple examples, which I think are well, give a good intuition of this. So let's take omega to be the counter measure for the middle third counter set. So you put usual construction, you put equal weight to each one of the intervals of the counter construction, you take a weak star limit and that's your counter measure. Now we have to choose the other measure sigma. So sigma is going to be a bunch of deltas with some weight, it's one of the deltas. The deltas are going to be placed in the blue gaps. These are the gaps of the counter set construction and they're going to be placed close to the center. Uh, how much weight should we put? Well, we want to satisfy the A2 condition because this is going to be an example related to this theorem. So let's say, for example, you are here, you forget about the rest of the world, you only look at this interval, and then you say, well, let's take the omega measure of this big interval, that's 3 ikj, and assume that you only have this delta, let's forget about the rest of the deltas. So then uh, you should we impose that we satisfy a precursor to the A2 condition, namely that this is one, this fraction is one, which gives you immediately the weight. Once you do that, 
if you impose that weight to each one of for each one of the deltas, uh, you compute and you get that as long as your deltas are close to the center, you get the A2 condition for this pair of weights. I mean, all the deltas in all the gaps and the counter measure. So now we have the operator is going to be the Hilbert transform. Now, uh, remember I said where I am going to place the deltas close to the center. So let's place first them at the center. What happens then? Well, the weight pair satisfies the A2 condition, fine. We satisfy the forward testing condition, but we fail the backwards testing condition. Backwards testing is this one. And forward is the, I mean, the, the opposite. So it's going to be, namely, we satisfy this one, but we fail this one. Okay. The, what this means, where is the, where am I here? Yeah. What this means is, first of all, these conditions are independent, uh, which was, I mean, not known at the time. And also, uh, it was not known at the time, this is the relationship to the Sarason conjecture, whether A2 was sufficient for the two-way norm inequality. This shows that it is not, because all of these three conditions are necessary for the two-way norm inequality. Uh, this was a, there was a much, I mean, a previous example, first done by Nazarov and Bolberg, and then also Nikolsky and Trial of the situation. So, I mean, we weren't the first one, but their, their example is more involved. So let's place the weights somewhere else, not exactly at the middle, but somewhere close to the middle. So if you take Hilbert of omega, it's going, the graph is going to be something like this, strictly increasing from minus infinity to plus infinity. So there's going to be a unique zero. We have some estimates that the unique zero is close to the center of the interval. And when I say close, I mean relative to the side, to, this, to the length of the interval. So, and then we put the, the deltas there. And if you put, if you do that, you do satisfy the two-weight norm inequality. I haven't told you why yet, but you do. But you do not satisfy the dual pivotal condition, which is this one here, this one here. So this is the example that proves that you can satisfy the norm inequality, but not pivotal conditions, hence the pivotal conditions are not um, necessary. And another moral of this example is that if you compare this case where the deltas are placed in the in these zeros of h of omega with this case where you place them in the center, here you have the you do not have the norm inequality in this in this case. In this slide, you do. And we just perturbed a little bit the location of the deltas. So this problem is extremely sensitive to small perturbations. Okay, that's another moral of the story. Okay, so first main theorem, it's appeared in a two-part paper. First part, Lacey, Sawyer, Sen, and myself. Second part, just Lacey, which is the essentially the proof of the Nazarov trial Boldberg's conjecture. Uh, the statement is that if you assume that you have locally finite positive Borel measures and you have no point masses in common as uh, Nasarov, Trail, and Boldberg assume, then you have the dream. The, the two-way norm inequality holds if and only if you have A2 and the two testing conditions, and you don't have to assume any side conditions. It's just, I mean, it's an if and only if. You don't have to assume pivotal or anything like that. There's a, I've, now I remembered, I forgot to mention why. Okay, about the date. So this was published in 14, 2014. And I forgot to mention uh, the two dates here, the 2014. So this theorem was proved in 2000, but it was in a CRM preprint, which the authors, or at least one of the authors, lost. And uh, when we came up with our paper in 2014, uh, well, you can see the, the posting of this paper of Nazarov Trail Bolberg in 2014 in Archive, explaining that. Yeah, that one of the authors lost the paper, and then, uh, well, basically, I was given I was giving a printed version of the paper. They scanned it and they posted it in archive. And anyway, so that's why it appeared in 2014. So okay, this happens enough. Anyway, so going back to this, to the T of one theorem, the T of one characterization of the two-way norm inequality for the Hewlett transform. Uh, after our theorem, then uh, Hitonen removed this condition of having no point masses in common. 
So you have uh, the full conjecture is true for the Hibbler transform for general Radon measures. Uh, this is what Heaton did, is that he ran the whole proof. So I mean, the, the problem is that if you have point, point masses in common, A2 is going to explode, to blow up, because you have, uh, let's look at any of the A2 conditions, for example, even the, yeah, this one. Let's say, or, or even this one, the classical one. If you have a point mass in common, you shrink your cubes to both, to, I mean, to that point mass, and the supremum blows up because the, the denominator is going to go to zero, but it's going to be strictly positive and bounded away from zero. Okay? So what he done and did is that uh, he repeated the whole proof, but with a slightly changed or punctured, not, not punctured, but I mean, A2 condition with holes. So namely, you have uh, uh, in one of the worlds, the sigma world, you have the measure of the interval, but in the omega world, you have the A to fat and A to tail outside of the interval i. So then if you have common point masses, you don't see them. And the dual corresponding one, no? And you, he run the whole proof, the same proof, and that's how he obtained the, the theorem. No? I mean, it's in a nutshell, of course, it's more technical, but that's basically the, his approach. No? Okay, so a couple of ideas of the ingredients of the proof. So the key improvement or the key new tool with respect to Nazarov trail Bolberg's uh, proof, scheme of proof, is what we call the energy condition. So if you think in terms of, pro I mean, it's basically you think of the weight omega, the, the, I mean, the, the measure omega restricted to y. If you want, you can normalize. And then you're basically, in probabilistic terms, you're basically taking the variance of that random variable. Okay. So, because it's normalized, it's going to be at most one. But if you are, I mean, it's like the variance. So, so I mean, it really measures the concentration of the of the measure on that interval. So it's going to be zero if you have a delta measure. Uh, this in, this quantity is going to improve the smoothness of the kernel estimates. I'll explain in a moment. And for in terms of notation, but this is the average with respect to, to omega. No? So. The energy condition that we introduced is it looks the same as the pivotal condition. The pivotal condition is the same thing without this factor E squared, energy squared. So again, you take I zero, you decompose into a partition of intervals, IR, and you impose that this kind of uh, quantity is bounded by sigma of I zero times a, a constant. The best constant is energy, and then the dual, you interchange the two measures. And I sh should explain, I mean, you can think of this E to be dimensionless, kind of. And then you have one omega here, two sigma here. Each time you have an omega and a sigma, you pretend in terms of dimensional analysis, whatever that means in this context. You pretend that they cancel out. It's like kind of A2 condition. So you are left with one sigma. That's, kind, that's why you have an, a sigma here. It's kind of a, I mean, that's the sort of philosophical dimensional analysis, at least formally. You know? So how, do, how does the energy condition appear in the sufficiency proof? I mean, where, where does it improve? I said it's going to improve the, smooth, the smoothness of kernel estimates. So let me explain in a toy model why. If you run the familiar argument to bound, I mean, to show that the Hilbert transform is bounded, I mean, with, I mean with a, once you know it's L2 to L2 bounded, you want to show it's weak one one. And then of course, uh, you interpolate it and dualize, etc. So when you show it's weak one one, you go to the I mean good and bad function, Calderon sigma decomposition, and you are reduced to the bad functions, which are supported in the in the stopping cubes, and you reduce matters to estimating this guy. H is silver transform, Bj is a bad function, we are outside to Ij. So as we all know, you subtract zero because the average of B is zero, and this guy allows for a decay outside 2j of a quadratic decay, which is much better. I mean, once you have that, this is the essentially the, the Poisson kernel. And, uh, oh, sorry. And, and that's how, uh, I mean, classically it's done. Usually you don't write here Poisson kernel, but that's, I mean, it's just an, another notation. Okay, so now let's repeat the same. And notice, by the way, sorry, in Lebesgue measure, you usually take this x prime, to be, I mean, 
it could be anything, but you usually take it to be the center of the interval, ij. So now let's do the weighted version of this same calculation, this same very well-known calculation. So now you have the bad function with, with respect, if the, which has zero measure with respect to omega. The blue things denote the new ingredients when you put the two weights. And then instead of subtracting any point, we let omega choose the point through the expectation. The good thing is that, for example, assume omega is a delta, delta measure on the interval ij. Then this guy will be zero. So that's a huge improvement. And uh, in general, I mean, the more concentrated it is, the better improvement you have. So then, well, uh, once you are here, you basically run, I mean, you take the absolute value inside the integral. Then you, the last line here is going to be copied in, the, in this slide here. You do Cauchy's words. And here pops out this term, which is precisely part of the, well, of the square root, if you want. Of the left side of the left hand left hand side term on the energy condition. I mean, this guy is the square root of this guy. So that's why I said this is kind of the meaning of the energy conditions where it pops up. It controls the oscillation. Uh, I mean, this oscillation outside IJ. Okay. So and then. The basic idea, again, in a nutshell, of what we did was we inserted this, calcul I mean, this calculation into the huge machinery of Nazarov trail Bolberg, which, I mean, the point of this slide is to emphasize that it's a complicated construction that they did, no? uh, with many, many decompositions and terms, et cetera, you insert, and that's how we proved our theory. OK, so that was, that's an overview of the classical, I mean, of the case of the classical operator Hilbert transform. What's the state of the art with T1 theorems? Uh, as of today, I mean, you have, what's known today is you have the norm inequality. As we saw with the norm inequality, you can deduce the two testing conditions. Here, the notation is, it's supposed to be a T and a T star, it's frac to T or T star. So before it was, this is the same as these conditions here, the testing conditions for the Hilbert transform, but now for a different operator, I mean, the operator T. It's the same as the where is this as these ones. Okay. Now we call it T and T star. Okay, so so we know those are necessary. We also have A2, which is usually necessary if the operator is non-degenerate. And another condition that I will we will remove in a moment. So forget about it. It's called the weak boundedness property. And you would like from these three to go back to the norm inequality. So you would like these three conditions to imply again the norm inequality. Um, these three, con I mean, you have these two extra conditions, which are the energy conditions and the sort of big theorem, big in the sense of, I mean, a hundred plus pages, is that uh, if you have uh, these three conditions for the Hilbert transform, from these three conditions, you get the energy condition. And then with all these five conditions, Again, I'm removing this WBP condition. You get back the norm inequality. So um, the proof of this theorem in the case of the pivotal condition was Nazarov trail Bolberg because pivotal condition implies energy condition. Remember, the energy condition is the same except that you're introducing a factor which is less than or equal to one on the left hand side. On the left hand side. No? So we thought, well, can we do it in more general situations in other general calderon segment operators? No? Well, we can only do so much. So here, uh, the pivotal conditions are not necessary. I'll explain to you why already. This is the Cantor set example. We know then that the energy conditions, which is what we need to recover the norm inequality here by that long theorem, uh, is going to be true in some special conditions. For example, if you have uniformly full dimensional measures, that's a theorem of Lazy and weak, or one measure supported on a curve, or something called k-dispersed, but anyway. So if you have that, then you have something called energy reversal, which I haven't explained, but it's some technical condition. This technical condition implies energy condition, and then you recover the norm inequality. So then we thought, well, okay, nasarov tail bolberg conjecture, the pivotal conditions were true, were necessary, sorry, not true, necessary for the norm inequality to hold, false. Maybe this is necessary for the norm inequality to hold, false. Maybe this, which is weaker, is necessary for the norm inequality to hold, 
false. So uh, this, by the way, is a peculiar perturbative argument in the following sense. The only way to, to prove the norm inequality in this scheme with two weights, the only known way so far is through the energy conditions. <coughs> yeah, there's a question, Anna? <coughs> Oh, no, 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 no. Okay, sorry. So, so the, so what we had to do is we built a pair of weights. We satisfy testing A two and these two energy conditions, hence the norm inequality. Then we perturb slightly the weights so that the norm inequality still holds, and hence testing an A two. But the perturbed in it, the perturbed weights do not satisfy the energy condition. That's how we prove this theorem. Okay. And then, as I said, there's a probabilistic argument called uh, surgery in the literature, which gets rid of this condition, this uh, WBP. And this is everything that's known to date for the two-way T of one theorem, or T of one problem, if you want. Okay. So now we move on to a generalization, which is the local TB. Let me explain what this is. So T of one, this kind of theorem says that the norm inequality will be true if and only if it's true when you test over the function one. As I said, this is hard to check to some extent. I mean, there are cases where you can check. So, but for example, if you are familiar, and again, 99% of you know it very well, the, the proof of the L2 boundedness of the Cauchy transform on Lipschitz graphs, uh, there's a T of one proof, which is I mean, with one weight, this is just one weight, which is, I mean, kind of more or less involved, but not very involved. And there's basically a two or three line proof with something called TB theorems or local TB theorems. I mean, the hard part is to prove the local TB theorem, but then with that, you can do a two or three line proof. So what are these TB theorems? The point is that instead of being forced to choose the function one or characteristic function, you can choose another function which is somewhat similar to one. But you have the, the option to choose which one. So you choose one which adapts well to your problem, and then it's easier to check, and then you can get the result you want. Okay, so what are these type of conditions? They are here, TB. We are going to take a function BQ. So the function depends on the cube, the same way as the characteristic function of I depends on the interval I. No? Supported on Q. It's going to be essentially bounded, essentially meaning LP bounds. Okay, meaning essentially in a moral sense. So some control on the bound, in this case, LP norm. And essentially one, meaning the average not very degenerate. That's what it means in this context. So this is in the sense in which these kind of functions are similar to the characteristic function of Q. And then uh, we're choosing P to be at least two. And we say that it's a P weekly mu accretive. Well, this is, I mean, sort of technical jargon, but. It means that we have these family of functions like this. And then we assume we have the testing conditions for the operator on the BQ and for the dual operator on BQ star. So you have two families, for it, uh, one for the, the forward testing and another one for the dual testing. Uh, the T alpha sigma, so again, think of this as Hilbert transform or, or any fractional or, I mean, Calderon sigma operator no? or, any, or any singular integral operator in general. Okay, so these are the equivalent of the T of one conditions. Now it's local TB. And the theorem, which is which well, was admitted, it's still, I mean, was admitted recently, is that if you have locally finite positive orbital measures, you assume you have a singular integral operator. Just think there's a small technical condition on being gradient elliptic. This is for the to recover the A2 condition. You assume you have this family of weights, the P weekly sigma equity family of functions and the corresponding for the dual. Then you have the norm inequality. I have to explain something about the norm inequality in a moment, but you have it assuming you have the two testing conditions, which we know are necessary. A2 conditions, I'm not explaining what these two are. I mean, if you want, I can, but it's basically various flavors and variants of the A2 conditions. So put them all in the same sack and the energy conditions. And now in one variable with the Hilbert transform, we know that testing plus A2 implies energy. So in one variable, uh, this is not just a less than or equal, it's also an equivalence. 
because they are, I mean because these are necessary, this is necessary. I mean the equality goes in that direction for these uh, six quantities, not for these two. But in general, we don't know if these two are necessary. As I said, uh, even for the t of one case, here it is. They are not necessary. So I mean it's not not to be necessary for some cases. So so this is the best we can do. I should explain when we say the norm inequality holds, what we mean is that it holds uni uniformly with uni this uniform constant in smooth truncations of the, of the operator. No? That's what we mean by the norm inequality hold. A couple of remarks. I already mentioned this one dimension thing. Now let's translate this into the one weight world. If you have one weight, then the classical A2 condition, which is even weaker than the fattened one, becomes what's called in the literature nowadays, either upper doubling measures or polynomial growth measures, okay? So in this case, if you have one weight and this A2 condition contains this upper doubling condition, A2 and energy are automatically satisfied. So here, uh, you just have, I mean, you can erase from this little hand to the right. This is automatic by the problem. And then you will have the classical T1 theorem. So if and only if, uh, you have the, the testing conditions. So this means that for one weight, we recover a slightly weaker um, version of a theorem by Lacey and Martikainen, which is the one weight local TB theorem. I say slightly weaker because here I had explained that these weights are considered for P bigger than or equal to two, but in the theorem, we only get P bigger than two. We miss the endpoint. In one weight, they do not miss the endpoint because I mean they can use they well they use some interpolation which is not available in the two weight world. Okay, so okay, a couple ideas of the difficulties in the n-dimensional theorem. No? If you go to the one-dimensional version of this theorem that I just uh, that I just explained here, in the one-dimensional version, at some point we use fundamentally. A, character, a theorem of Hittonen, which characterizes the restricted bilinear inequality. So this is almost like Hilbert, except that you put absolute value, so you lose all cancellation. And here you integrate over i with respect to sigma, and the, with the g you integrate over the complement of i. So this inequality is true, I mean L2 to L2, with a constant, and the best constant we call it d, but uh, if and only if you have a2, the two a2 conditions. And this best constant is comparable to, to the sum of the A2 conditions no? with square roots. So we use this fundamentally in one way, sorry, in one dimension. And then you try to go to higher dimensions and this theorem is false. There's a counter example, which was proven by Grigoriadis and Paparichos, which both of them just graduated. They are students of Eric Sawyer and mine. So then we have to substitute this, this heat on its inequality with and certain involved use of probabilistic techniques, which is the what's called the NTV surgery to handle the nearby term. No? This probabilistic strategy, I mean, it's basically when you decompose into dyadic intervals, both, I mean, in the bilinear form, so both F and G, uh, it's this idea that you have one, one interval. So let's assume one of the grids for F, which is fixed, and the grid for G, you randomize. So then, uh, the enemy, the bad guy, is when a big interval for F and a small interval for G are the way my hands are posed, so meaning close to the boundary. But if this moves randomly, then the probability of that happening is very small. So because it's very small, you can absorb that term. And I mean, that's basically what, what's called this NTV surgery. Uh, this idea is, as far as I'm aware, was originated by Pfeffer Manstein in a simpler case. And then Garnett and Jones exploited also this idea of averaging over dyadic grids. I mean, it's a very old idea, but the, this, the use of this idea in this world with two random grids moving simultaneously is what's called the, the surgery of Nassau of the were the ones who used it in this fashion, the first ones to do it in this fashion. So, okay. So then uh, if you have heat on its characterization, the good thing is that you have full testing conditions. Full testing meaning the following. I have to go, this is page 35. I have to go quite a bit back to show you what full testing means. One moment. 
full testing means that here, here, instead of integrating over Q, you integrate over LF, all of RN. That's full testing. Okay. Let's go back to 35. So, so if you have heat on M, or, I mean, of heat, if, if you have the bilinear inequality, then you have full testing conditions in one dimension as a consequence of the A2 conditions. This allowed us in one dimension to prove something called pointwise lower bound property, namely that the testing functions BQ are pointwise bounded away from zero without loss of generality, meaning no matter which functions we are given, we can modify them to assume this without loss of generality just by increasing a little bit the constants in a controlled way. And this simplified a bunch of arguments. Uh, well, with higher dimensions, we cannot do that, but we have an es that it essentially holds. The same thing essentially holds, except on small sets, which is and how small is controlled by a Carlson condition. And then another difficulty in several dimensions is that in one dimension, we, I mean, intervals have only two boundary points, and then we could do something called indented coronas, which is some kind of coronal decomposition starting from the edges. In higher dimensions, we have to use a much more integrate, in, integrate, intricate tree of Carlson cubes as a substitute. But those are the main difficulties to go from one to higher dimensions. And let me give you, I mean, I've given it sometimes, but it's basically my favorite application of this, of this two of one theorems. Among other things, to address the criticism that these T of one conditions are impossible to check. Well, they are not so impossible to check, okay? But they are hard to check, I have to admit. So it's just a last conjecture on distortion of QC maps. I'll give you a quick uh, overview of that. So a quasi-conformal map in the plane is going to be an orientation preserving homeomorphism between two planar domains, which is in the Sobolev space W12 locally, and satisfies this distortion inequality, you know, where these are the directional derivatives. So it distorts all directions in a comparable way. And the comparability, worst comparability constant is k. Another way to express this is equivalently that the Jacobian, meaning distortion of area, is comparable up to this constant k to the square of the worst length distortion, which is given, of course, by the uh, norm of the differential operator. Yeah? So distortion of area comparable to the square of distortion of length of length in the worst possible direction. If instead of homeomorphism, you just require to be continuous, then the map is called K quasi regular. Then in, in the complex plane, any such quasi regular map, is going to solve the so-called Beltrami equation, D bar equals mu D, where mu is the so-called Beltrami coefficient, which is an L infinity function of norm strictly less than one. And conversely, if you hit this equation with Calderon Sigmund theory, you produce a unique homeomorphic normalized solution to this equation, to the Beltrami equation. The standard normalization, one standard normalization is to fix zero, one, and infinity. Okay. So these maps appear in a lot of places. For example, uh, I mean, in, well, I mentioned just a few. I mean, in, in hyperbolic three manifolds, Kleinian groups, in several problems related to the conjecture that the Mandelbrot set is locally connected. Also, it appeared in, I mean, also related on the Fatu conjecture. They appear in the Laplacian and in well, inverse problems for, for impedance tomography, uh, nonlinear elasticity, etc. I mean, not, I'm not really an expert on these areas, but they do appear. Okay. So, what is the intuition? These maps are conformal map. Conformal is an old terminology for analytic and one to one. A conformal map will, will multiply, I mean, it's the by a, by a complex derivative, which is a complex number. So then your multiplication by a complex number, if you think of it, you're just dilating or contracting by the modulus of the number and you're rotating by the argument. So you're going to send in an infinitesimal circle to an infinitesimal circle because you're just dilating or and rotating. A quasi-conformal map will carry an infinitesimal circle to an infinitesimal ellipse and the eccentricity is controlled by at most k. The macroscopic picture is that they take a disk to a quasi disk. So basically, uh, you can put, it's going to be a funny shape, which could be highly regular, like non rectifiable, for example, the snowflake. But uh, you can put, if you send a disk, the image is going to look like a fried egg. So you can put the yolk of the egg, a small circle inside, and the, the frying pan 
a big circle outside, and the radius of the yolk of the egg to the, the radius of the frying pan is bounded by a constant that only depends on k. So you cannot have something very long and thin, like a cigarette, cigarette, or you cannot have something that almost touches itself, like a horseshoe. Okay, I mean, maybe connected here, but here it, it almost touches itself. And they can distort dimension, as I already mentioned. The image, I mean, the, the von Gogh snowflake is, is a quasi, a, a, an image under a quasi-conformal map uh, of, the, of, the, of the line. No? And the typical examples are, of course, conformal by Lipschitz and radial stretching. OK, so what Kari Astala did, I mean, it's a very well-known theorem of his, very celebrated, for which he got the Salem Prize. He proved that if you have a quasi-conformal, appropriately normalized map, uh, then you have this inequality where the bars denote area. And, one of, and then the point is that 1 over k is the optimal exponent. I mean, that's the important thing. As a consequence, remember for a quasi-conformal map, where is this here? Yes. If you know how you distort the area, you should know how, you, how your differential operator behaves because of this inequality. So indeed, as a consequence, you obtain the best um, solar space to which the map belongs. This is optimal. And you also have a dimension distortion theorem. That if you have a set which has at most dimension t, your image set has dimension at most t prime, where t prime is this, this exponent. And this was conjectured by Ivanik Martin in 93 for n instead of 2. The case of n instead of 2 is still open. Because you don't have Beltrami, well, you do have Beltrami in higher dimensions, but it's not so useful. It's overdetermined. So what we proved, I mean, is Kari Astala had proved dimension t goes to at most dimension t prime. We proved Hausdorff measure t zero goes to Hausdorff measure t prime zero, and this is optimal in the sense that if you put here finite, you have examples where you get finite and positive. You have here examples where you get finite and positive. So this is the theorem here, which the picture is this one here. It's a highly non-self-similar Cantor set. OK, so one when you try to prove this conjecture, at some point, you get to this condition. So you approximate your set by a bunch of disjoint dyadic cubes in the plane and satisfy this something called a packing condition, which is explained here. So let me just to explain it in a picture. Pretend this supremum is one, and pretend t equals one. So then, what we have is a bunch of cubes, l p, so that for any cube q, when you add the lengths of p, they are at most length of q under these conditions. So this is pictured in the following slide. Here's your q. I'll go back to the previous slide in a moment. Here's your inequality that you have to satisfy: constant one, exponent one. This is clear because if in this picture you just project, but with these constants, this is not allowed. You said you violate this inequality. So this is basically saying this condition is basically saying that in some sense this is t-dimensional, this collection of cubes. And the sense is that it approximates the t-dimensional house of content. So then once you have these cubes, you define these measures. They are supported on the cubes, on the a collection of cubes, and they are set up so that when you integrate with respect to Lebesgue measure, uh, you get LP to the T. So you get this right hand, this piece, this summation piece. Okay. And there's a theorem which says that if you have the Berling transform, the Berling transform is another classical Calderon Sigmund operator. It's like the Hiller transform, but in the plane. Instead of convolving with one over x, you convolve with one over z squared. So um, then you have this two weight, well, this, this weighted inequality. If you didn't have this red thing, you would need for this inequality to be true that the weights are EP weights. Uh, and this is why this inequality is not a contradiction, because these weights are compactly supported on the collection of the union of P's, so which an AP weight cannot be. So uh, you could say, well, maybe you can extend to an AP weight. Yeah, well. You could, but there are constructions which make the, I mean, we have examples which make the AP constant blow up. So this inequality does not follow from the AP theory. And there is a short and publicity of one proof. So the point of this was to emphasize that, well, this T of one uh, condition 
can be checked. And I think that's all. Thank you very much. These are the references. And I guess. I don't know if I should stop sharing or, yeah. Ignacio, are there questions for our speaker? Well, they think I have one. Okay. Uh, so I, I seem to recall that I saw a preprint on archive some time ago in which you discuss some of these questions in the setting of metric spaces. Not me, but, but okay. Uh, Okay, that maybe was not you, but that there is. I, I believe sure. I, I was. Uh, I was wondering whether you can comment a bit on on that. If there are additional difficulties, or or I mean, how much of this machinery? Maybe maybe I can phrase my question better. How much of the machinery you employ is actually Euclid Euclidean, or so that you really need Rn? Um, there's a. I mean, as far as I'm aware, you can basically run. We, I mean, I've mostly, well, basically only focused on RN because it's <laughs> it's already complicated enough. You can run a bunch of this machinery in, in metric spaces. So it's not, I mean, but um, yeah, I mean, I don't. I, I was uh, wondering particularly because uh, you said that the non-doubling case is what's the enemy. Correct. So, so there, for the for the measures, which of course I mean, yeah, okay. Right, because it's, because I am aware that the ma doubling machinery, let's say, is a kind of well understood in metrics. Yeah, doubling, mas strategy. doubling machinery is not a problem. Yes, correct. Right, and I I, be, I believe that should many times goes through to metric space. Yes. I was wondering correct. if there are difficulties. I mean, if the non doubling difficulties will will pose a challenge in metric spaces or something like that. That's that's that's. I, I don't, yeah, I, I don't have a good answer, meaning I haven't really looked into, I, I, I mean, I've been aware that there are some some conditions on non-doubling metrics, but I mean, spaces, but I have not really gone into the non-doubling case in, meaning, sorry, I have not gone into the metric, uh, general metric situation, because yeah, already with the, with the non-doubling measures, we already have a lot of problems. <laughs> So I'm not aware of any especially new difficulties in that context. I'm not aware, but again, I haven't, because we are focusing, we are, I mean, we're trying to prove the one theorem, of course, and the local TV. And so far I've not, I mean, there are other conditions that uh, there's a, some kind of generalization of the energy conditions, et cetera. But as far as I'm aware, the whole thing goes through in, in metric spaces, I mean, is, as far as I'm aware, it's equally difficult. There are not, essentially, essentially. I see. As far as I'm aware, uh, again, I haven't focused on that, but as far as I'm aware, that's the case. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for a very nice talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm.